as a humans we will always be more creative than ai because ai ultimately is learning what we are teaching it i don't think it will find truly creative things on its own now this whole if else big chunk i can just remove and put ai and it can take care of that it seems like oh this is awesome and this is great it seems like something impossible which i think a lot of people never thought like uh, ai would be able to do learning now is as a founder you need to do the sales initially and you hire sales person after you have found a way to sell welcome to the singularity syndicate podcast where we bring together leaders researchers innovators and intellectuals to discuss transformative technologies shaping our future i'm najaf faisal Joining me today is Sarav Panda, Cornell University graduate, co-founder and CEO of cloudcode.ai. Welcome to the program, uh, Sarav. Yeah, thank you, thank you. It's an honor joining you today. I'd like you to start by telling us about your journey um before even starting the cloudcode.ai. I can say like I had this uh bug in my brain since i was a child like to start and doing a business so earliest business i remember is i was selling dragon ball z drawing so one of my friend was very good at making art so i would provide him supplies like drawing sheet and colors and he would draw it and we would sell it to our other friends uh, which was then banned by my teachers because it's not allowed to do all this business in school but that is i i would say like when i started like doing uh, focusing more on startup and then i uh, went to father agnels for my bachelor's in mumbai and uh, there i got a very good opportunity to kind of uh, experience different domains so i started like working with android app uh, development in my first year so then i was like okay robotics seems very interesting i was in robotics for 2 years we went to uh, national level competitions doing that and uh, from robotics slowly in my third year i gain more interest in machine learning and computer vision and that's like when i started kind of working on ai and uh, technical stuff but the ai that time was very basic you know like it wasn't that cool like as it is today uh and once uh in my i think in my third after my third year i started doing freelancing so i was taking like small gigs like doing projects on the side and making money and i decided i will kind of continue this path rather than going for a placement and getting a job which is very common in india and uh, once uh, like once i started doing freelancing i used to get all the school projects and which i could decide what i want to work on and then i would code them and get pretty good money because they were international projects so they would pay me uh, way more than what i would earn in india so that was great and there i realized uh, at a point i was getting so much uh projects like i wanted a team so this led to my first startup creation which was called scrape next technology it was a service based company we hired couple of developers and we were kind of taking projects and building like software like uh uh one of the projects i remember was we were building like a uber eats kind of delivery service but for palestine uh, there are like lot of un workers there but there is no proper service so one of the person i found he wanted to make the project didn't scale because the covid happened and he had to stop financially but that was something cool which i was working on during that time so uh this is like once i started script next after one year in freelancing i was doing more of ai kind of stuff like building chatbots and things like that for people and there was a lot of risk uh, uh queries for like chatbots in 2018 2019 So I was like, oh, uh, I can start a company around this. So my second startup was an AI-powered chatbot platform. Uh, the company was called Botonomics Automation, and there I like uh, with my friend uh, we co-founded it and we started creating this like AI chatbot platform. Uh, but unluckily, when we started building, COVID hit. I had to learn how to manage people when they are working remotely. It took me some time, and uh, we were able to finish it. We kind of made it public. uh what i learned was i was not good at sales so i was not able to sell it properly and first mistake i did was i hired a person to de- do sales because i was like oh there is a guy he will do sales but my experience was like what i'm learning now is as a founder you need to do the sales initially and you hire sales person after like you have found a way to sell to people 
So in India, I was not able to do like that is a great tip, by the way. That's an excellent tip. I agree with you that you know, as founders, we have to know how to sell our services first, and then once that works, once we have product market fit, then we can hire a team to and and tell them exactly the process and teach them how to sell that particular service. So you've done yeah. this. AI, AI chatbot company and then what happened yeah so uh, so once I was I put it out in the market uh, we got a couple of clients uh, which we were super excited uh, during that time we got an offer for exit from one of like I was doing freelancing on the site so I used to earn money from freelancing and put it in my company so that uh, I can kind of survive so I used to earn from freelancing and pay salary to my employees so uh, one of my freelancing company, they wanted to acquire me. Uh, but during that time, because we just got a client, we were like very bullish. Like, oh, we, we can do it. So we said no to that deal and we went ahead. But uh, the market wasn't good. We weren't able to sell. And other thing which we realized was in India, the uh, B2B sales is kind of tough. Like you need to show a lot of value. And uh, like you can't have a very big margin while selling in India uh, to B2B unless you have good network and one thing i realized that time was i didn't have a good network neither in india nor like in general because my parents like my dad works in a government uh job and my mom is a housewife and we don't have any big connection so uh couldn't uh, like that was one of my learning uh one of the reasons that why i decided to come to cornell because the ivy league uh tag name would help me kind of build this net network and know people uh, who can help me in future so uh, I got this offer for exit. I said no. But after six months, we were running out of cash. We had like six months of cash and we didn't get any new customers. So uh, then we went ahead and we uh, kind of uh, went for the exit. Like the uh, my client still wanted to acquire us. But then this time it was half the uh, valuation what he was ready to offer that time. So uh, we, uh, I was like, okay, it's fine. Uh, I have to do it because I'm going for my master's to Cornell. So, uh, yeah, then I came to Cornell. Uh, I did in Cornell Tech, which is in New York City. There is a very beautiful Roosevelt Island, like a uh, very beautiful campus. I really loved my two years there. Like, uh, so uh, it, it, the Cornell Tech uh, program is very focused on startup. So that's why I came to that program. Like they have like startup related courses and they also actually fund for startups uh, at the end of like and uh, end of your uh, master's. You get to pitch in a competition and if you win you you can be part of like a uh, startup studio and they give like 100k in investment was so, it hard to get into cornell yeah i think it was hard uh and uh, the thing is they also get very few people in like cornell tech campus is pretty new so they weren't getting a lot of people so it was kind of tough to get in the program with so much competition but I would say like if you have been working and if your goals align, uh, they would pre uh, that matters more to Cornell rather than like uh, just your credentials. So they also look, are you someone who wants to do startup? So if you have like good credentials and you actually want to do startup, I think Cornell Tech would be a good choice for you because they value so the entrepreneur. Yeah. You think because you have already started some companies back in India, this made your application stand out and that's how you got accepted? Yes, I do think because it's it, it kind of makes me relevant to what they are teaching and what my career goals are. So, yeah. Uh, and I would like uh, highly suggest if you want to be in startup and don't know how to navigate the waters, uh, good, good way to start your career. Uh, excellent. And then, uh, so basically your company, cloudcode.ai, was incubated at Cornell University, would you say that? Or you did it completely after you finished? Yeah, actually, I did it completely after. So in Cornell, so we have this competition, right? The pitching competition. So I was part of a different team called Fig Health. Uh, it was a health tech based startup. Uh, they are still doing great. I just uh, like met them yesterday. So uh, they are building something for uh, US healthcare system. And what I found out was I was not a good founder fit for that problem, like especially uh, health tech kind of domain. I didn't have any experience, but I was super excited because the problem seemed to be there. 
but you know it wasn't that technical problem of a sol- to solve like when it comes to like health tech uh, you are just using basic technology and i wanted a little bit more challenge so that's why uh, i went and i created my own company on the side like i didn't participate with my team in the pitching competition and i just went and started cloud codea that's an amazing story um so tell us what is cloudcode.ai so at cloudcode we are building like a ai assistant for devops and cloud engineering so uh the future future which we visualize is uh, there is a concept of on call like all the developers they have to be on call and continuously monitor their system anything happens they have to fix it ping it so a lot of time they have to wake up early morning at 3 am because something goes wrong in the system uh, what we want is ai to do that for you as a human we should get like our 8 hours of sleep which we want so we are building a system which can automatically kind of help you build and deploy software to the cloud but also manage and fix issues when it pops up so that is the problem which we are trying to uh, tackle and we strongly believe like all the software developers would love that because uh, all of my friends they hate to be on call because they can't get like free time and relax during that time so your target market is uh, software developers Yes. in companies or or you're selling to companies or to individuals yeah so uh, i would say we are more b2b we have we plan to have something like individual just if you are a hobbyist and you want to try something out uh, but mostly will be a b2b startup and initially we are going to target like uh, uh, startups and smbs because uh, there is like uh, still some uh resistance to ai in big tech companies because they have they have concerns for data flow and how the system works so we plan to kind of start with startups make like show how ai can actually solve their problems use this as a case study to kind of go to enterprises in future that is very interesting and i agree with you i'm seeing more and more like the larger the company is the more it becomes like a turtle it's really hard to move it's hard to move forward and it's all because you know all of this risk risk uh, management you know the, the bigger the company the more inflated it is the more at stake um and therefore they would move very slowly when it comes to adopting new technologies they will be uh, outgrown by young uh, dynamic startups and we have a great great example right in front of our eyes and uh, this example is open ai right so you've got google and all of its might and power and you've got this startup um that nobody heard about uh, two years ago and this startup created chat gpt and then all of a sudden google announced a code red in their across the board and then they had to rush and rush and um do all of what they do to try to compete with the next per, next company on the block and i think what you do right now is that you are powering those little startups yes. where these other big companies are sleeping trying to mitigate the risk and trying to uh, yeah we have to study the data flows and the security of our systems and do all of this due diligence where other startups that you are powering they are running and they're taking your system and you know running with it and all of a sudden they will start competing with the big with the big um, with the big guys so i think this ecosystem is pretty healthy because it allows competition right it, so it allows startups to compete and so i um i really love it what you're doing do you have a lot of competition doing exactly what you're doing uh we do have like in different aspects so what the thing is we are trying to do like a end to end system so you start like when it comes to deploying a software you start like just our system helps you generate code like terraform and docker which are required to kind of put that system on a server and then also maintaining it and updating it constantly so we have like different types of competition i would say there are some people who help you in like the first part when it comes to deploying software like they have drag and drop tools where you can kind of design system and then when you click it kind of deploys uh and 
then there are like other competitors who have like who provide this ease of use but with limited services and you have to use their own servers so one thing which we are uh, trying to change is like uh, your data should be yours okay so we don't want to kind of own the system so we give you power like you can have your own aws account and you will use our system as like a third party contractor kind of thing who helps you manage your system we don't want to take away and store data also uh, with us because uh, we do feel like you should have power to like say no if you don't like our service you should have like easy right to move away from us that is excellent and that's i think back in the day when i was just starting out there was an issue when it comes to web development right like back like maybe 10 15 years ago where they were like a lot of web development companies will develop websites and using their own source code and then companies will find it very difficult to move away from these companies because they kind of like blackmail them because they you know they, nobody can understand their code and then i think this reminds me of that movement of uh, open source um, content management systems and wordpress and drupal and all of those platforms that made it easier for companies to switch. If you are not happy with your developer, you still can switch to another developer and then they would, everybody understands the code and move forward. And I think you're right about doing this because I think the trend is honesty and transparency and integrity. Nobody wants to work with a company that might blackmail them one day and take control over their, their infrastructure. So you're right about this. Um, when you say, it's powered by AI. Are we talking generative AI or are we talking um, big data, data analytics, predict, predictive models, stuff like that? What are we talking here? Yeah, so actually uh, we, we have both the components. So because there is like two set of problem, uh, one is like uh, creating something and other one is kind of looking at something and taking action. So for looking at something and taking action, we are using predictive AI which is more on the monitoring side, but for creating and managing system, we are using generative AI when it comes to like code generation, generating test cases and uh, looking at things. And we also have like a lot of automation just to make sure like generative AI doesn't go outside of what it's aimed to do. So uh, it's mix of that. So it's like a good part of software engineering, good chunk of generative AI and a little bit of predictive AI. So I'm assuming since you said that, that your company started after ChatGPT. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It, I have a good story for that. I was planning to do this uh, uh, company, not with AI, but I was planning to do like a drag and drop tool, which anyone can visualize and then draw it. And then based on the drawing, your system will be deployed on the cloud. And uh, the, because my experience was this is very hectic even for big companies they are not able to kind of manage their resources and even with like 20 30 people they still can't optimize it because it's kind of very fragmented so my initial idea in my idea book was like to create an open source project with drag and drop uh, platform but in last april like end of april when i wanted when i decided i will go separate with my previous like startup and I'll go on my own. That time what I did was uh, I went through my idea list and I saw, okay, this is an idea, but now we have this AI technology and I sat and did like an MVP and I saw, oh, AI can actually do, there were like a lot of problems in drag and drop, which I was thinking of creating like if else condition for everything, making it open source. So like we have all the conditions covered, but now this whole if else big chunk I can just remove and put AI and it can take care of that. And I was like, wow, that is great. So that's how I came up with that. Okay, this makes sense. So let's move here and build this idea. Yeah, that's um, incredible. Which brings me to a question that I ask almost to all my guests. What was your first impression when you start interacting with ChatGPT? I would say I was kind of active in the whole journey. So like from GPT, GPT-2, like I had tested them out, like GPT-2 people had started using in Excel and stuff. It was cool, but chat GPT actually gave like more human-like response, which made it like 
from the belief point of view it seems like oh this is awesome and this is great it seems like something impossible which in i think a lot of people never thought like uh, ai would be able to do because people were thinking we need a new kind of uh, architecture design or a new way to train this model because i uh, we don't think the size will give but suddenly there was this unlock where ai was able to kind of mimic a human so that was super surprising and fun for me to watch and yeah even being active in this field and following things i got super ex- excited because that seems totally like something magic to me even though i was very active in the field and i knew how the progress was going yeah cuz usually when people are following the progress of uh, natural language processing uh from the gpt2 to 3 they wouldn't be as surprised as someone who saw this for the very first time and i think yeah. the reason why ai becomes super popular is because of that because people were sleeping i'm talking the general people not software developers like you but the general public were sleeping all along and actually not only that even investors and business people were also sleeping because remember ai was um before ChatGPT, I would say, it was, okay, yes, people are talking about it, people, especially like in the business field, but nobody was expecting the transformation to happen that quickly, um, especially coming, uh, coming from a lot of AI winters and ups and downs in the field and uh, periods of uh, very intense hype, follow, followed by periods of uh, disappointment in the field. So I think people were sleeping for the most part and then ChatGPT kind of woke everybody up to the power of this technology. I totally agree and I'm just reading Sapiens and that also kind of talks a lot like why we as humans evolved a lot and one of the key things was language and if you see like why we as a human are still like uh doing like we are intelligent our intelligence mainly comes from language because language gave us a way to exchange uh not only like uh equipments but also like thoughts and knowledge which you can pass down so one concept is previously like for animals everything was passed down on genes so they would have this reactive uh thing but with humans we can kind of get it from books as well with a lot of like person because uh, we had elders who would pass down their knowledge and help us support and now with like internet it made made things more democratized and now ai is i think going to unlock everything just to add to the point of the chat gpt i feel chat gpt because it was free for everyone to use that is why like it became this mass uh, adoption like uh, i feel all the previously available uh, kind of AI systems, they were kind of like something which a developer needs to deploy or something behind like a paywall. So no one had proper access to what the current level of AI is. But with ChatGPT being free, everyone was able to use and see, okay, how AI can kind of interact with you. Do you think AI will be creative one day or is is AI right now creative? I would say at some extent, yes. Like uh, suppose like if you take a field, uh, where and put someone who is not from that field, I think AI would be more creative. Like maybe when it comes to design, AI is more creative than a non-designer like me. But then it it's not as good as the actual designers who's who are experts in the field. And maybe AI will get uh, creative. But the thing is, creativity is all about expanding, right? Like moving away from like if you know this circle, going to the next part. Correct. So. I just feel as a humans, we'll always be more creative than AI because AI ultimately is learning what we are teaching it. Okay. And when we discover something new, we are going to teach it. So um, I highly, highly doubt it will do something uh, which we don't know. It might give us kind of like direction on new creative ways, but I don't think it will go ahead and find truly creative things on its own. Yeah, and that's that could be a topic of a podcast by itself. Um, business challenges for cloud code dot AI. What is your targets for the next three, four, five years, and what are your uh, pains? What are the main um, 
challenges that you're facing right now? Yeah, so uh, for the goals, like uh, we want to kind of, our vision is like we want our system to be able to take care of like end-to-end -end, uh, uh, like management of cloud resources and give this power to everyone. So everyone can be a 10x engineer. And this is what we are going to strive for. We do feel like in uh, in a year or two, we should achieve like a basic level where we are able to support like small, not very complex systems, but then slowly scale to more complex like enterprise level so that we can support them where they have this like 10 different cloud accounts and different cloud providers and all the resources. We can provide our services to them. So that would be uh, my like five years goal. When it comes to business challenges, we are like still kind of identifying. So we have found this go-to-market strategy of targeting startups. So we need to kind of validate it and see if it works. Right now, we are getting a lot of positive signals. So that is good. But idea would be in next six months, identify if this is the right thing. Or do we need to pivot in basis of like whom we are targeting or what we are providing? Because ultimately, uh, we need to start with giving value to customers, even though we have a vision of building a system, because if we are not able to add value today, it doesn't matter like if we can do it five years from now. And what is uh, your go-to-market strategy? You mentioned that how how you're gonna how you're marketing your your uh, your company. Yeah, so right now we are in public beta, so we are more more looking for like uh, design partners, so which is kind of a high touch. I am reaching out to my community people who might be interested and in, like doing more of like a, a in-person kind of onboarding. But in general, we want to have like product-led growth because we feel that is a good route. So idea is like uh, once we are ready, we'll put the product out and people can self-serve, like come use it and set up things because our goal is like you shouldn't need an expert. So we want to start doing that. So for next uh, year or like un plan for... Uh, immediate next year is like go, uh, going through this product-led growth marketing strategy. Yeah, but how are you finding those startup developers? Uh, is there like communities, Reddit, um, Discord? Like how you how you're getting in touch with with these people so that they can know about your company and try it? Yeah, so right now we are mostly doing like uh, communities because uh, being a founder, that's the advantage I have access to all other founders who are talking so I can help them out. And uh, we are trying to get conversations, like if we can actually genuinely help them. So like not all founders write their own code. Some of them like outsource it or some of them use like Wix or drag and drop system where we can't help them out. But for people who are facing the problem, we can help them out. We are trying to chat with them. So I think initially for next couple of months, it will be more of a community and uh, in-person kind of events based like marketing. But then once we go to product led growth, it will be more like social. We want social engines to start working and promoting our systems all across. Uh, we I have started a little bit. I've been active in Twitter like for since January, I think so. Uh, and hopefully that helps out like in building the audience. Uh, so you're talking about organic social media, like yes. content yes. that is uh, organic, not paid. Have you considered paid or not yet? Uh, not yet. So, so uh, what we want is initially we want to identify, okay, what type of customers are actually want to use it. And then we can put a lot of money. We might experiment a little bit with paid, paid marketing just to see which section gives like a good response. But right now we also lack a lot of features, which we feel is necessary to have that good experience as a user. So uh, once we release, I think we can do that. Like a paid how much market. lead time you have? Like how how uh, how much um, how much time have you given yourself um, before reaching uh, profitability? Uh, yeah. So for the profitability, we have given like one year right now. The thing is, we want to focus more on growth, so we might push profitability. Uh, and kind of take more investment and grow on that. But just in case, you know, the market is not good, right? So we have this side strategy of how to be profitable just in case the VC market doesn't work out. But uh, idea would be more of like leveraging, like we are kind of like a pretty fast and like kind of first mover. I won't say first, but like we are early 
lot of people don't uh, need this and the market is pretty empty so we want to capture them and make money so that would be our main focus but in case it doesn't work out we do see like we if we want we can be profitable in 9 months right and are you backed by any uh, vc or or not yet uh yeah so we have we are backed by plug and play tech uh so they wrote like one of the first checks for us uh but we are mm-hmm. still raising like we are still in pre seed we are raising our round is open but we are looking more for like experts in cloud or people who can add value not just money and uh, once we have a little bit more traction we want to jump to next round of like raising a proper seed round are you on the y yc uh, y combinator or not not this platform uh, not yet we we do plan to apply to yc and uh, let's see uh, that would be like a very good channel for us uh, i think a lot of young startups they would like to go through yc and we would apply and let's see if it works out got it and you you mentioned that if uh, if startups are using wix or no code platforms you won't be able to help them yeah uh, the thing is wix and also basically all your data is stored by the wix and uh, bubble right so uh, we are helping like in if you have your own cloud account and you want to have ownership of your own data then we can help you out and also you need to write code because we don't do the business side of code like making the design the ui ux and all we only help you with deployment like the uh, in it infrastructure part of things what is the advantage of writing your own code and you know and not using these uh, no code platforms yeah so the thing is no code is very uh, good when you are early and you don't have a lot of clients and you are experimenting but as you start seeing user this no code will become like 20 25x costlier to you so you can kind of have like this 20x of profitability by just moving to like a, a your own cloud system so that is i think like uh, all, that's why you'll see all the tech startups uh, who are like like who sell tech they write their own code because the uh, the margin is made on like that part because 1020x is too much according to me like uh, you would be losing a lot of profit points like the basis points in profitability yeah that makes perfect sense when it comes to jobs in the development side of things uh, software development writing code and when you see uh, generative models uh, writing code um do you feel that it's still a good career to be a software developer or you think that you know people should start learning something uh, uh, something else so uh i feel so like i feel there are like two types of software developer one who are actually passionate about software developer and do it for because they enjoy it and there is other part which feel like there is a lot of money so they learn it and then they go uh i think both of them is okay but people who will suffer is people who are not passionate and not like uh, good at it people who just know like basic writing code won't be i i think writing code won't be valued in future uh, what will be valued of like thinking code like can you think how complex system should be designed because what you will do is like you will be kind of like a senior engineer who is thinking in your mind of how your system should look like and then you ask ai to okay do step by step like this so ai would be like a helper for you and you as an engineer would be the designer like architecture kind of who builds the whole software and there is one more advantage though like ai is democratizing technology so anyone can start their company and make like 10x of the money which they can go and get like which they'll make when they go for a job so everyone has like i think pretty soon everyone will be able to build more complex startups and sell their services and a lot of small small problems which are there we'll find a lot of groups going and solving it and companies also would wouldn't need like a lot of people okay so this does mean like uh, they only need a so- lot of software developers but the other side of it is being a small company you can actually tackle a big problem because with just four or five people you can actually go and compete with googles and things like that and that is going to be pretty good like uh, there is like a big difference right like when you see big tech you are seeing oh they have the best engineers they have the best technology but uh, with ai everything will be with you so you can be the best one 
you are not like lacking that functionality on your end. So it looks like you're very optimistic uh, and it looks like you believe that AI is a catalyst for entrepreneurship. It's a catalyst for new uh, businesses to start. It's a catalyst for new problems to be solved. So you think that the future is to, uh, or, or probably you are encouraging everyone to consider starting their own business? Yeah, yeah, I would highly encourage. And I think everyone has a problem and a different perspective and you can go and try it out. There's a lot of money to be made if you solve a pain point. And with AI, you have all the resources which you need to solve a pain point. Even the market research, like AI can do it for you. So it can give you like, what's the problem and things like that. My last uh, question for you, I'm sure that you watch a lot of science fiction movies about like AI taking over the world and stuff like that. Do you think these could be realized? Do you think that AI safety is is real? Do you think that um, AI might actually dominate the human experience? Uh, I So I don't think like AI will act on its own. So I do feel like AI is also like a technology, like a phone, like a car, like a military tank. So basically it depends on how you are using as a human. So it it will be always like a human behind the AI who is doing negative thing if it happens. But I think AI in general won't automatically start doing negative things. And uh, the future, which is, uh, it will kind of make us very complacent in a lot of things. Like uh, we have, like nowadays, we don't remember a lot of things. We don't even remember emails, don't even remember phone numbers. And with AI, we'll stop remembering a lot of other basic stuff, which we felt was key to us so that is going to be a negative impact but in general i don't think like ai will go rogue and kind of start having negative effect but humans can always go rogue and it will automatically be on that and ai safety is important i would say like we need to think on how to create systems but uh, i also want to promote like open and more democratic ai so it, it shouldn't be like only governments have access and general public is not having because uh, everyone should have access, but you also need to find ways to make sure it doesn't create a, prop, create a problem like to humanity. So Rav Panda, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you so much. It was great talking to you.